friends, welcome to the Three Pillars Podcast with your host Griselda Barreto. Aviation Today's guest is Tim Van Bevera. Tim Van Bevera is a journalist, photographer, cameraman and filmmaker. He has been involved in the media industry for more than 30 years and has played an important role as author, director and co-worker in the development of several award-winning film and television productions, including the German Federal Film Award, New York Festivals, International Great Lakes Film Festival and others. Since the end of the 1980s, he has also reported from crises and war zones like the popular uprising in Nepal in 1989, Kurdistan and Afghanistan. He accompanied the Nobel Peace Prize laureate and former Federal Chancellor Willy Brandt at the end of 1990 on his successful humanitarian mission to Iraq in order to reach the release of the Germans and other citizens of dictator Saddam Hussein who were kept in strategic sites as human shields. He reported as a correspondent on behalf of private and public TV providers from the crisis area of the Gulf and later the Balkan conflict in the former Yugoslavia. Van Beveren himself became a direct witness to the conflicts of the modern era. From 1998 to 2005, he lived and worked as a TV and print correspondent in the USA. Since 2008, though, he lives in Berlin. In 1986, Tim Van Beveren was nominated for the Max Ophuls Award and in 1988 for the Federal Film Award for participating in Das Trebus. In 1996, he won the gold medal at the New York Festivals for the TV documentary Fear is Included in the Airfare, A Crash and Its Consequences. In 2015, he won a total of four international awards for the documentary Unfiltered Breathed In, The Truth About Aerotoxic Syndrome. In 2016 and 2017, he was awarded with several honorable mentions by IPA and Monochrome Awards. In 2018, he won the Best Documentary Made by or About Women at a Live Dog International Festival at Los Angeles for Women Composers. In 2019, he won the Best Documentary Feature at the 10th World Music and Independent Film Festival at Washington, D.C. for Women Composers. Conclusion to the Tim Van Bevera podcast interview. And uh, so what were, what were your biggest trials that you faced during the filming of this documentary then? Well, first of all, it was really very dramatical that Richard Westgate died so unexpected. And on the other hand, this was a great responsibility to, to deal with this part in an appropriate manner. And on the other hand, you have to make sure that you do not endanger the ongoing legal side of this investigation. So that was some sort of a balance act there. But it took a strange avenue then, which I wasn't used. I, I worked for WDR for more than 30 years. I went to war areas for them. I basically went for them through the fire. But uh, uh, here something very, very strange happened because once the documentary project was approved by the chief editors, all of a sudden problems were starting. First, exactly the very same editor who did reject our prior efforts to do such a documentary became now the responsible editor on behalf of WDR for this particular program. And uh, then, to my amazement, rather than clearing the way to produce such a film, he put more and more obstacles and stones in way. Um, then something weird happened that uh, the names of the first intended protagonists were leaked to some airlines, in this case to Lufthansa. And I found out that our computers were not safe and I was running into a problem with my obligation as a journalist to protect the identity of my sources. So I, I, I did set up a secure server based in Switzerland with a 24-7 uh, support um, of a white hat hacker who was keeping it up and running, and thereby we were communicating with all these people, including the legal team of Westgate, uh, Dr. Mulder, and the forensic team, and the uh, scientists. Yeah, and um, well, then all of a sudden, my dear WDR editor thought that I should do this film together with a second editor, which is not wrong at all. I, I had a very good friend in mind who I worked with before and who uh, was on the payroll of NDR, the other station that was on this investigative team there. 
um, but WDR rejected him. So they got me a guy on my side who I later learned was, despite that he had a very well-paid fixed job with a public broadcast station. Uh, well, you have to understand that this is like your your public officer. Yeah, mm-hmm. you cannot be fired. Yeah, and you're very well paid to be independent. Well, in this particular guy, he did receive a tuition from the German industry organization to conduct uh, networking studies at a private industry-owned university at Berlin. And interestingly, this private industry university has only 60 students, but 120 mentors who care for them. And among such mentors are, for example, the director of communications of Airbus Defense, the head of the PR department of Lufthansa, head of PR <laughs> department of BMW, Rolls Royce, and, 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 and. Wow. And then, strangely, all the protagonists that we had chosen for featuring them in our film, and my colleague was taken care of, such as a former Lufthansa chief stewardess, a former Gulf Air stewardess living in the UK, and others quit, or he decided that we may not feature them out of whatever motives. It was really, really, really strange. And, um, well... In the end, I traveled once around the world with this guy, not knowing that I had a mole right next to me sitting here. So, And Mm. the film ended disastrous as far as I see it from my end and today. When our chief editor, Sonia Mikisch, saw the final edited version a month prior to the projected broadcast date, she wasn't that happy at all. I felt that was because it was somehow a soft wash of very solid facts that we obtained during our research. Mm. And the film lacked its investigative assets and the highlights and was very indifferent in its message. So I wasn't happy either. So I suggested that I will do a re-edited version on my own editing system and without any costs for the station because we already went over budget and um, put that new edited version then up for discussion. And that was fine. We had a month to go. There, we had no pressing date to meet. But that was declined by Mr. Angara and uh, our dear editor in charge on behalf of WDR. And of course, I had committed myself to our other protagonists. And among them, for example, was a young flight attendant from Berlin who became partially paralyzed after a severe fume event aboard a Condor Boeing 757 in Las Palmas in March 2013. And as there were still ongoing talks about a peaceful termination of her working contract with Condor, because of course she became permanently unfit to fly, um, I agreed to discuss all the interview passages of her appearance in the film with her attorney prior to the broadcast. So then all of a sudden I was informed by WDR that I should not do the last changes on my film and that Mr. Angara would do this uh, himself. And despite my protest as this is a very unusual step and I did never ever experience something like that in, uh, with WDR in the 30 years that I worked for the station um, this was a fact so all of a sudden the attorney of this uh, flight attendant was asking me for the parts to be used uh, of his client and uh, which parts and what and I could not say anything as I didn't know which parts Mr. Angre intended to keep and which ones he would cut out And on the other hand, also the attorney representing the Westgate case, uh, Frank Cannon, had to clear the part related to the Westgate investigation, as here in this very particular case, this was subject to an ongoing coroner investigation and the subsequent court case under British law. So this is uh, quite tricky because if the film would have been aired before the publication of a scientific study or before the coroner had opened the case officially by setting a date for a hearing, this could be regarded as contempt of court, which is punishable in the UK. So then the lawyers uh, couldn't get an answer from me. uh, So they asked WDR because I couldn't answer their questions and they got two different answers. One lawyer was told that I'm no longer the editor of the film and the other was told that I'm the editor of the film, but WDR does not see any obligation to stick to what these gentlemen and I have agreed on. So presumably WDR's legal department thought that these lawyers do not talk to each other, but of course they did as they were working on similar subjects. So this thing blew straight into the face of the station with the result that both protagonists withdrew their consent for the broadcast. 
So, and then a week prior to the scheduled broadcast, all of a sudden I received an email, not from WDR, my employer for more than 30 years, but from, well, guess who? Lufthansa's PR department. And <laughs> they were telling me, um, dear Mr. Van Beveren, we learned from WDR that you are no longer the editor of the intended broadcast of your cabin air subject. Um, okay, so I learned from Lufthansa's PR department, not from my station, that I'm no longer the editor. And that was the point in time I got my lawyers involved. And ever since, we are talking exclusively via them. And the trial is finally set for, I believe, this autumn, something like that. So the film then was broadcasted. My name was erased. And it was only a film by my fixed employed colleague. And uh, to my understanding and my taste, it was a very, very poor, bad film that was aired there. Sometime in the middle of the football championship and in the middle of the night when nobody was watching, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was one problem. I had uh, given my word to some very brave people that I will make their cases heard in public and that I will uncover the issue and I will bring it to the public. Yeah, well, one problem. The problem is that I had given my word to some people and some of them very brave people because they provided us with inside information. They're risking their job. Um, that I will make their cases heard in the public and I will uncover the issue and I will bring it to the public's attention. And uh, the problem with me is that I keep my word. So I decided then, uh, <laughs> excuse my French, uh, WDR, do my own version. And as I own roughly 80% of the footage, because I shot it personally with my camera and uh, WDR, did not even compensate me for that, despite that they told me that they were going to compensate me uh, for that. Um, it was somehow very easy. So I amended the footage that was owned by WDR exclusively. And a year later, the film Unfiltered Breathed In had its premiere in Berlin. And um, then the film received, yeah, you mentioned it, four international awards and uh, is so far considered as one of the best films existing at the moment covering the story from the past until today. True. And it's an amazing uh, uh, film. I mean, I just wanted to ask you, hearing this entire story is, uh, I mean, shocking. I mean, I can't imagine what all you were going through while you were making uh, this documentary. But what gave you the courage to pull through? Were there times where you said, I just want to, yeah, I know you're a man of your word and things, but were there times where you were completely frustrated that you wanted to give up? And what helped you push through? Well, yeah, there were times that I was very frustrated and um, more than once I was uh, uh, given up. I invested my entire pension insurance uh, into the finishing of this film. No, but uh, on the other hand, I believe I, I owe this to these people that I met since 2008 and who are suffering and who are not in the position that they can defend themselves. And so it's, well, it's probably a problem from my education and from my my dear father who always told us to my brother my sister and me that uh well we are privileged uh, he's paying for our education he is putting us to good schools but we have the obligation that we have to help people who are not that privileged and uh, that's somehow very deep inside me so um that was basically one of the motives and yes i i, I met many 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 people who really need help and need the story to be out. Otherwise, they are lost. Amazing. So it's actually your humaneness that brought out your, uh, you know, your conviction to finish this uh, documentary, which is amazing. So well done. And uh, I know that this, uh, this film has inspired or has actually informed me as well. It informed me on the actual basics of aerotoxic syndrome and, and the whole cover up involved with it, you know, and what the victims go through and, and how they are suffering. And so it's a inspiring documentary, uh, very heart touching. So well done. And then you won the award. So that's like amazing, you know. Yeah, well, awards. Uh, financially, it's a disaster. But uh, yeah, that's it. Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm very pleased that we finished it. I had unfinished work. So what have the reactions been of the industry towards your work? Well, um, you don't make many friends on this side yeah. when you start digging in such uh, obscure issues and uh, if you start asking questions. On the other hand, 
this is exactly what journalists are supposed to do ask questions so uh, you may not always like what they ask but nevertheless um, i think the industry is not very pleased with my work they well they re refuse to uh, answer questions or come up with phony stories uh, trying to pull dirt on you uh, fine but this is what i'm used to being an investigative journalist and having worked in this field uh, for 20 years um, so this is not shocking me at all mm. um, let's see where they end up in the end but have you ever felt threatened during this entire you know this entire period what do you mean by threatened uh, if you have bucks taken out of your apartment you consider that a threat uh, yes that happened uh, but uh, physically no I, they, they do it different they play it differently they're using their networks you don't get jobs well they even write you nice emails like i, I got an email here from the head of the german aviation lobby group uh, he said well Mr. Van Beveren, why are you always uh, putting this dirty uh, up here on our famous great airlines and Lufthansa? You should try to look into other things, uh, like, for example, the, the new engines that we are using, and you would see some jobs coming along your way. Now, this is usually how it works, but um, mm. yeah, you can't buy me. And as I said, I'm, I'm not good as a suppository. Okay. Uh, probably a stupid question. Is there going to be a sequel? <laughs> <laughs> hmm. let's see <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> oh you said maybe oh cool so maybe i could come back to you in a couple of months uh, to hear about your plans <laughs> well um, I th no actually um, i have in mind to work on on a book on novel uh rather than um on a factual book uh in a novel you can you have more freedom and um to well, even to point to people, well, you can always write this nice sentence there. It's uh, There's no connection to living or dead persons. So, so uh, I I wrote a book also in the form of, uh, it's, it's a true story, but I wrote it in the form of a fiction story so that you don't go back to the to the actual victim, but the story is out there, which is, you know, you want the story of aerotoxic syndrome to get out there, but not involve the people because then, you know the industry and whoever else can actually attack the victim so uh, yeah that's that's a good way of doing it so i'm looking forward to this book of yours then yeah well maybe in a year or so i'm great. done with it great mm -hmm. and so tell me something what are your thoughts and feelings on this sickness on aerotoxic syndrome hmm. well a long overdue to be resolved problem I, honestly, I think it's a shame for the industry, which is uh, proudly telling you that they are the best, that they take care for their employees and that they're, and, and of course, they take care for their biggest value, which is the paying customer. So you and me as passengers, and uh, uh, actually they're not. And it's it's a disgrace. And I think it's time that, well, maybe prosecutors start to look into this issue. And uh, has it had an impact on your life personally? Well, definitely. I, as I said, I, I used up my, my pension insurance to finish a film. Yeah. Um, I'm still involved in an ongoing litigation with my former employer for more than 30 years, WDR. They do not hire me again, and they do everything that I do not get hired by any other of their sister stations either. So this, uh, this were pretty uh, rough times I went through. And you're still fighting, actually, isn't it? See, I studied law, and uh, I take this from the sport. Well, say it differently. I'm, I'm, I'm not shy in taking up a fight if somebody wants to fight with me. Yeah, I'm, I'm not trying to ease my way out if the opponent is somebody I can tackle and I can cope with. And here, this opponent I can cope with because they are wrong and they are doing the wrong thing and they are lying. And um, as long as I stand up and I can still watch my face in the mirror every morning, uh, it's fine. Okay. So what would uh, your advice be to the aviation industry, to regulators, politicians? Fix the problem. A-S-A-P. Really, the industry should do it. It's a long, long time overdue. Well, let's say silently they have started to do it. Yeah, that's, for example, you can buy the Airbus A320neo with a non-bleed system. 
it's available. Uh, nobody buys it because it's not mandatory. That's the other problem. So there is the point where the regulators should step in. And if the regulators don't step in, it's the politicians who have to step in. But uh, I don't know. Well, politicians probably live from the money that the industry is paying for their campaigning. That's the miraculous circle here. But definitely it should be fixed uh, as soon as possible. Yeah. And what would your advice be then to the crew, the passengers and, and people in general? Well, to crew specifically report it, write official reports, create paper, get copies of these reports. Mm -hmm. uh, also, and I know this is not very prudent in this job, leak it to the media, leak these events to them, make these reports available to them so that the media gets involved. Well, and the other thing, well, just a couple of months ago, I got a call here uh, on my cell phone of a good friend of mine who is a pilot. And he said, we were just coming into Tegel and we had a fume event. Uh, what shall we do here? And uh, I went to the hotel to see the entire crew. They all got something. The co-pilot was definitely in a very bad shape. And I told them, go to see a doctor. Uh, immediately get your blood drawn, build up a file with the evidence. Apparently, nobody did. And this is where the problem is. Uh, many think, well, if it doesn't knock me out immediately, I'm lucky and uh, I continue. But this is not the case. It may be that it doesn't knock you out immediately, but it will definitely come back to you, maybe in some months, some years, or some decades. And then you have a problem if you cannot prove your case and you have no evidence and this requires you have to get the aircraft logbook well at, at least the registration you should report it so to the authorities that it is on the file because then only later uh, you can make up your own claim and even if legislation is going to change or there will be a change uh, somehow in this uh, system you still need this evidence to prove then that you got affected Mm. Uh, I, I see some change here with uh, some very brave people in France. Uh, and you see that uh, not only Mr. Macron has his problems with the Yellow Wests, um, also apparently with some pilots who, rather than filing a civil suit, uh, they filed a criminal complaint against EasyJet and Air France. And now the prosecutors are looking into it. And that could be really a change. Yeah? And um, I think this is the right way. We are in Germany, nobody ever dared to file a criminal case because of that. Not crew, not passengers. Uh, despite that, we have people who died, we have dead pilots, we have heavily affected flight crew, but nobody files a complaint. That's that's the shocking thing, actually. You know, we, like Germany, France, we all are part of Europe. We are we're supposedly uh, supposed to be together, but each state has its own ruling and, and its own conditions. Yeah, well, this is what they use. This is exactly what, what the other side uses. They, they outplay them. Yeah? Um, yeah. Uh, they, they try to, well, it would be great if those people who are affected yeah, would really unite because this is what is always underestimated, the power of people pulling together on one side of the rope. You can really make a change, but this requires that you all stick your heads together and you forget about personal problems that you may have with one or the other. And this is not done. Yeah, it's we have single people uh, up front yeah, fighting for something, and the others hide behind it and are uh, somehow uh, afraid of getting into the first uh, row. And this is not going to help. Yeah, and no, the thing is, uh, you know, like pilots especially, the job is so specific that they don't want to lose their job. So even if they are feeling sick, as you know, they would not report it. They want to continue flying to be able to earn that money, to be able to pay their bills and mortgages and everything else. Similarly for cabin crew. So they need to, you know, go ahead. even worse if I'm, if I'm looking at the pace of a cabin mm -hmm. crew rather than to pilots. Pilots are a little bit better off. But there's one difference. Pilots can sometimes afford a private health insurance and thereby they are covered. Uh, what I've seen in the past is that there have been settlements between airlines and pilots. Of course, nothing goes to the public and nobody can talk about it, but money has changed uh, sides here. 
this is done and this is what the industry is trying they're buying out people and this is what some people also expect but well i know here in germany an airline is offering fifty thousand euros for a flight attendant that's the price for a flight attendant who claims that he's unfit to fly because of fume events and some people take this fifty thousand and go um okay if you're 24 25 26 that sounds like a lot of money but when you are getting older and you get problems with your nervous system and you cannot do any other job because you cannot concentrate for more than two hours or something like that, mm. you're done. Yeah. And then 50,000 is nothing. So this is what most people don't think about. True, true. Um, tell me something, Tim, you have uh, your private flying license. Do you still fly? Well, <clears throat> flying has a really bad, bad impact on our environment, as we all should know by now. And so I'm trying to avoid to fly whenever I can. Yeah, sometimes I'm going out with some friends, take a small plane, fly somewhere for fun. But uh, I'm cutting that really much down. Also, travel. And well, the one thing is I was in New York two weeks ago and I was looking at different uh, websites uh, to find out who flies with a Boeing 787. And I found United going from Frankfurt to Newark. So I flew yeah. United from Frankfurt to Newark with a Boeing 787 and returned. And because it has a non-bleed system and mm. the air is really much, much better and you won't run into these problems that we are facing in the other airplanes. But you were lucky there because not all uh, companies have that aircraft. No, no, but United has opened a route here and uh, I hope that we will see more and more airlines flying in with the 787s because that's the right way. And uh, uh, that was a good move by Boeing. They never admitted that it's due to the problem with the cabin air, but it has eliminated the problem. So they have other problems. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, that problem was thereby terminated. And hey, have you, have you flown in one in a 787? No, actually, I haven't, but I have heard that the air is much cleaner. It's much better, and I spoke to cabin crew working there, and they say it's it's much better working there because they are not so fatigued as um, the the cabin altitude is on a much lower, lower level than mm. in normal airplanes. Yeah, you have much more oxygen there, and um, that has some effect even on your work, especially with the heavy trolleys and all that kind of stuff. So, mm. yeah. Um, and you felt a difference as a passenger. Yeah, 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 definitely. When we were doing the film uh, for WDR, we flew around the world and I did the the schedules. We wanted to fly most different type of airplanes so that we can compare the data because we have also taken our blood uh, before and after each flight and have mm -hmm. analyzed it. And uh, we measured the air on board. And um, well, we flew from, the first leg was from Frankfurt via Delhi to Sydney on uh, Air India 787. That was the most relaxing flight. After 18 hours being on board of an airplane, mm. I, I, that was the first time after such a long, long, long range flight that I went out of the aircraft and I was ready to work. Yeah? So you Normally weren't jet lagged? Totally no, nothing. Not at all. Not at all. It was very, very nice. And well, then from Sydney to Los Angeles, we flew on an Airbus A380, and I had three days that I was sick. Um, oh. Well, it was the Qantas Airbus, which uh, lost an engine, by the way. And oh. uh, we had, later on, we learned we had um, high measures of tributyl phosphate, not TCP, but mm. TBP, which uh, points to the direction that hydraulic fluid is leaking into the air system there in this aircraft. We keep speaking about TCPs, and now you say that you actually had uh, TBPs. Wow. TBP, yeah. Yeah, Which is amazing. Hmm. Yeah. Were you affected by aerotoxic syndrome as well? Well, according to the DNA test that is available, uh, I belong to the group of the good metabolizers. So luckily, I'm not involved and I'm not affected. I recall a couple of human events that I've experienced as a, a passenger flying a lot in the past especially when i was uh, working as a correspondent in the us i was frequently flying between europe and the us and um, well i had two few events on lufthansa a340s which those days i thought well jet lag or something like that and i recovered after a few days 
But uh, no, I'm supposedly I'm lucky. I can metabolize the stuff and it left my body as mm. soon as it gets in. All right. Okay. So, uh, Tim, how do you see the future? Hmm. Short term, nothing will change. They yeah. will keep on their strategy of denial. Meanwhile, there is some change. Uh, filters have been tested. They have been introduced. But uh, you may buy certain aircraft versions bleed-free, like the 787. Yeah, you could buy an Airbus A320neo, but nobody does it because it's not mandatory. Mm. So I think that the, the industry secretly has uh, introduced a change. Well, looking long-term, I think that future aircraft will hopefully uh, very soon start to fly electric and thereby we have hopefully eliminated the problem at all. But when you say future, that's quite long term, isn't it? Well, they're experimenting on that. It's, uh, yeah. I, th I think that's the way that they can go and let's see what, what, yeah. what else they find. They have the ingredients there. <laughs> it's just a change which should start tomorrow yeah if well all manufacturers could start tomorrow to build aircraft which are bleed free then we still have the problem with the old fleet and you know airplanes are flying more than 10 20 or 30 years so we will still have these flying around with the problems but again their filters can be installed alarm systems can be installed well the pilots could be notified that something like that is happening at least and they could for example shut down the bleed valve to the affected engine. Yeah, that would also help. Mm. Yeah, minimizing the point. Well, that this is coming back from where I'm coming from in aviation is we have to eliminate threats and dangerous situations in order to keep aviation safe. And this is uh, what it should be. Yeah, but I think uh, it also it goes back to training and our pilots even trained because the industry doesn't even accept the fact that there is a problem with aerotoxic syndrome with bleed air or anything. So I don't think pilots are actually seeing bleed air as, uh, you know, toxic or whatever, so far at least. Well, I know many pilots who see that because they are affected mm. and they tell others, yeah, there are some who are really reluctant and they have this attitude as long as I'm not affected, what should I care? Yeah, fine. Okay. I think there the regulators are required. And again, as I said, when the regulators don't do their job, then it's up to the politicians. And the politicians in the end are elected by us, the people. So mm -hmm. let's see where it starts. Yeah. Good advice there. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, Tim, tell me, what is your current WIP, your current work in progress? What can we look forward to uh, from you in the near future? Nothing which has to do with aviation. <laughs> oh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, which which direction are you going in this time? <laughs> no, I'm. I did um, last year. I finished a film about women composers, as I found out that um, there are very, very, very good pieces of classical music composed by women in the 18th, 19th, and early 20th century, but they are never played in concert halls. That's because uh, we have uh, a male-dominated environment there. Now, everybody knows Mozart and Beethoven and Haydn, and that's what the people want to hear, and that's what everybody plays. But uh, there are great, 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 great works created by women, and they had many, many problems to do that. And so I did a a documentary last year, which was still shown in, in German movie theaters right now. November, it will be released as a DVD and next year, early next year as a video on demand as well. And now we are working on a second part of that, where we have even more women composers. One who is uh, from the same time as uh, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. And um, she was as well the first conductor ever heard of. And another one is Ethel Smyth, for example. She was uh, among the suffragettes in Britain, and she even composed the March of the Women, the hymn for the suffragettes. Yeah. Um, so we have her. And uh, no, that's pretty interesting because uh, it uh, is a nice story and has to do with great women and uh, no dirty games, uh, despite male chauvinism and uh, patriarchal uh, situations. Uh, but... Mm -hmm that can be taken care of. And um, 
yeah, it's a story also about gender and language, and it's nice music, and I yeah. like it very much. Yeah, amazing. Because you always choose these, uh, you know, topics that are different that you don't, that you rarely see, you know, other people working with, like aerotoxic, uh, like now this, what you're working on right now. It's amazing. So it's, I think you challenge yourself with these, right, to bring up something that hasn't been spoken about before. I'm curious, you know. Yeah, mm. <laughs> which is good. <laughs> yeah. Would you like to share any other important information with our listeners, Tim? Um, well, there's so much. I don't know what to say. Guys, keep yourself informed. Be curious. Be curious, yes. And ask questions. Never give up asking questions. That's the most important thing. And um, work together on a change. And it's possible. It can be done. True. True that. And uh, how can how and where can can the listeners view your film Unfiltered Breathe It In? You mentioned it before, but just very quickly. Well, it's very easy. It's on Vimeo, yeah. uh, Vimeo.com. So it's vimeo.com slash on demand slash Unfiltered Breathe In. That's the English version. Or for Capal Francais, it's vimeo.com on demand Le Syndrome Erotoxique. And the German uh, version is on vimeo.com forward slash on demand forward slash ungefiltert but Great. i send you these links and uh, people can go there and they can either buy the film or they can watch it one time or there are a couple of options okay, but it's good. available in english french and german and probably soon in spanish wow amazing so that's really european <laughs> well consider that more people speak spanish in the world than english true Agreed. <laughs> okay, and uh, how can the listeners contact you? Well, very easy about uh, via my web page, which is uh, my initials TVB. That's uh, <laughs> uh, what people call me TVB uh, Tango Victor Bravo uh, TVBmedia.de. So all together TVBmedia.de Delta Echo or for the aviators. It's Tango, Victor, Bravo, Mike, Echo, Delta, India, Alpha, Dot, Delta, Echo. So you still have your aviation language. <laughs> oh, you'll never forget that. Yeah, I know. I know. Tell me about it. <laughs> so, uh, Tim, it has been an amazing... Should I say TVB? Because I've been calling you Tim, but you say mm. that everyone calls you TVB. Well, yeah, many. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Tim slash TVB. Um, thank you so much for being on the show. It has been really informative, eye-opening, um, amazing to have you on the show. I hope I can invite you back, uh, you know, in the future somewhere so that you can update us on, you know, things that you've been working on or if you've got more information. And actually, what happened to your court case that's supposed to be, you said in November this year? Uh, no, it's October, October, late October, oh, no. end of October. Later, yeah, to see what happened, you know, the result of uh, the hearing and things. So, if you agree, I'd like to have you on at a later date if you're not too busy. And and thank you so much, Tim, for coming on. No problem. And whenever you come to Berlin, give me a call, and we have a nice coffee or a good glass of wine. We should. We will definitely. Thanks, Tim, for the invitation. Have a lovely evening then. You too. And uh, see you soon. Take care and yeah. happy landings. Oh, thank you. Bye, Tim. See you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining The Three Pillars. Please subscribe at chriselda.blog to win a free protective mask. See you next week.